Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Lorraine Wollert, and welcome to our afternoon panel on sustainable finance. We have a terrific group of people here, um, women, as it happens, uh, and we'll be talking about how we pay for this grand transition to our green and sustainable economy. Uh, it's all going to take money. Uh, and so we need to figure out how to spend that money, where to spend it, how do we even define what sustainable finance is? So I'd like to um, begin the conversation with uh, someone who really needs no introduction, but I'm going to go ahead and introduce her anyway. Uh, this is Sarah Bloom Raskin. Uh, she is a former Federal Reserve Governor, former, former Deputy Treasury Secretary, and now congratulations on your new gig. She'll be taking over as um, faculty director at Duke School of Law's Global Financial Market Center. So Sarah, thank you and congratulations on the new gig. Uh, can, can we assume we, you won't be joining the Fed anytime soon? Is this, <laughs> is this a, <laughs> okay. Thanks Lorraine, happy to be here and okay. have this conversation. Terrific, um, can, can we start with some really basic things like sustainable finance, like what does that, actually mean yes and it, it is a term <laughs> that is used just incessantly and it has really no um no um, agreed upon definition but it has certain components and um those components i think involve this notion that um as we meet move forward in growing the economy we want it to grow sustainably. We want an economy that is resilient. We want an economy that is inclusive. Uh, and we want an economy that really um, is characterized by a prosperity that permeates into every community and every corner. And of course, we know that right now we are confronted with one of the major, if not the major, existential challenges to our economy. And of course, that is the accelerating and unpredictable and alarming nature of climate change. And hence the, the term, I think, sustainable finance is how is, is essentially the question, Lorraine, of how does the financial sector and our financial system navigate um, through these um, essential climate harms? Um, on the one hand, a sense of, you know, of looming harm, and on the other hand, a sense of solution a sense of possibility and opportunity. And I think sustainable finance helps us helps us navigate that. Okay, so we, we hear a lot about like shifting the trillions, right? Moving money from maybe where it is now to where it's needed um, to push us toward greenness. So how do we, you know, you say we need to navigate. Um, banks and uh, development banks, uh, large investors, there's a lot of activity already in this space, attempts to move this money in the right direction. Um, is, is that enough? Like, is it working? Uh, what do we, what do we need to kind of push it along? Right. So essentially, um, we have different actors who are engaged in this. And there is um, certainly out of this administration, a sense that it is going to take kind of a whole of economy, whole of government approach to actually engage in this navigation. Now, the, the part that I focus on really has to do with the financial sector and what the role of the financial sector may be, both in terms of its, um, you know, the way it, it navigates and makes decisions as private actors, and of course, how our federal uh, financial and local financial agencies make decisions that create the right incentives for this navigation process. So it really, it, it really involves a lot of a lot of different, uh, a lot of different entities. And I, I would argue it can't be done without any of them at the table. So we essentially, um, you know, have have a, a, a heavy reliance on what the private sector is going to do here. But of course, we know that the private sector is not going to produce optimal results without some kind of uh, some kind of thumb on the scale coming from the public sector, coming from our agencies. Okay, and we did have a thumb, we saw a thumb on the scale uh, yesterday, uh, the financial um, FSOC, Financial Stability Oversight Council, which includes the Fed, 
Secretary Yellen, all of the financial regulators in the US, they came out with a statement saying, you know, climate is an emerging risk to the financial system. Um, I think that probably a lot of people already knew that, but now it's <laughs> it's been formalized, right? right, right. Um, what, it, 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 is that like kind of coming a little too late? Were you satisfied with what they did yesterday? Give us your reaction. Yeah, so you're exactly right, Lorraine. This is um, a first kind of significant thumb on the, on the scale, I would say, because as you described, the Financial Stability Oversight Council is a forum that actually is authorized by law, already, you know, already, already mandated to be looking at emerging risks, exactly like risks that 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 are that we are being, you know, confronted confronted with now. So um, as you described, there, um, there, there is um, now an exec, there was an executive order coming out of the Biden administration that directed the Financial Stability Oversight Council to answer certain questions and to address uh, the role really that uh, the financial regulators could play in this, um, uh, in this, in this, uh, uh, navigation that we now um, are confronted with. And so what you have in this report is you have some, um, uh, you know, you might say uh, some things that we all, all already knew about, but you've got, you know, you've got most of now the, the financial agencies convening around these topics. And, um, and I'd like to think that this is really, really just the beginning, because as you said, while there are some very important um, recommendations, in the report, there's also a, uh, a fair ways to go. Um, there is nothing in there, for example, that is agency specific. Um, so essentially, and there's no timelines. And so if you want to start to think about how firms are supposed to really get ready for this transition, um, not probably, there's not a lot of detail um, at, this, at this stage, uh, despite the fact that it's a very long, a long report, but, um, the, the detail um, is still, I think, uh, is still missing in terms of being being kind of a roadmap as to where the financial regulatory agencies might be going. Right, and this is this is you know a slow process, as, as you just said. I mean, in the U.S. now we have to go through rulemakings, um, you know, modeling, like all these things have to happen before we start seeing actual rules laid out for the financial system in this space. Um, is the US behind the curve on this? Well, it's a really, really interesting question, Lorraine. And you are right um, that it, it does take time to actually tailor and consider and promulgate uh, rules that are going to be kind of optimal, that are gonna, be, are gonna be the right rules. And at the same time, we are dealing with a risk that actually is putting us on a different time frame. Uh, we are in the midst of extraordinary climate change costs right now right at this moment. I mean, we saw what our summer was like. We are watching, you know, the, the, the wildfires, the hurricanes, the damage, the flooding, the, you know, the, the, the risks to coastal communities. I mean, we are in it right now. And hence the question really comes as to like, what, what exactly are we going, to, are we going to really let the perfect be the enemy of the good when it comes to getting some steering uh, being done by the financial federal agencies. So that is kind of the, that's kind of the challenge here. I, I think that the pace that they might be used to proceeding on uh, may not be the pace that actually is um, what is called for given the nature of the risk. And even that word risk, I mean, some people would say, what are you talking about a risk? This is, these are realities now. These are costs being born right now. There are consequences to our economy right at this moment. Uh, so this isn't a future event. This is now. This is happening right now. You know, and it's interesting because um, I was listening to some uh, financial services experts the other day at IIF, and my takeaway there was there's a lot of money just sort of sitting and waiting, um, waiting to be told sort of what to do, I suppose, or how to be deployed. Um, I get the impression that absent these rules of the road, you know, money can't can't be deployed. Is that 
Is that accurate? Like, what are you saying? That's accurate. There, that is certainly a big part of, of this equation because we do have a lot of capital and that capital needs to know where, you know, where the greatest returns are going to be. And of course, that notion of return, we're in the midst of adapting to because these are now, we have to be thinking about returns from this perspective of sustainability, this idea that we're going to actually need a a, a set of, say, energy providers that are going to be able to carry us through a, uh, through a set of climate challenges in a way that is, you know, sustainable, durable. But, and are so, they, yeah. but, do, but do these, does this money, is this money um, not working because we don't know where to put it? Or is the money waiting to be given rules? I mean, you could probably look around and find places to invest in green energy or sustainability, resilience. Um, why isn't that money being deployed in places like that? Is it a lack of rules or? or? I think it's a lack of, of good rules, right? So in other words, a lot of firms are making up their own rules and we do right. have we do have different international bodies coming up with different taxonomies and possible rules, but we also know that investment decisions, both, both by investors and by firms investing investor dollars, that those, that, that those kind of decisions require something that appears a little bit more permanent. So in other words, rules need to be, they need to be, uh, they need to be thought out, they need to be democratically based, they have to essentially have a lasting power. And if they're perceived as either greenwashing, something that isn't, you know, that isn't particularly durable, or something that changes that shifts with political winds, then I think those investment dollars are going to stay on the sidelines and not essential, not, not exactly know where to go and certainly not go to their, you know, sort of to their optimal, to their optimal, you know, investment homes. So um, this, I, I think this idea of rules is, is, and we can call it rules, it's really, it, it doesn't have to sound so foreboding. It really is just a sense of where these, um, you know, how investors should be thinking about uh, the um, returns that they could be getting given the risks that we're facing. Hmm. I mean, and, and there are some, you mentioned taxonomies, right? As, as I'm sure most people know that Europe is ahead of the US in this space. Europe is, and other countries too, are working on you know, stress testing. They're working on um, taxonomies for, uh, you know, what's considered green versus not green. That's just shorthand. Uh, Europe is moving in a sort of prescriptive direction. Uh, and here in the US, we're just getting started. Uh, SEC Chair Gens Gary Gensler has said, all right, let's figure out, disclose we're just now starting with disclosure. Um, the Fed is just now thinking about stress testing, right? Um, Europe is ahead of us and Europe, it seems likely that Europe and the US will end up in different places with their rules. Is that, is that a, a problem, a risk? How does, how does, you know? <laughs> yeah, so, you know, so you've got a, you've got an interesting assessment there, Lorraine, in terms of, you know, different, uh, different timing devices. I am, you know, I, I agree with you that our, in the US, our first approach seems to be on the disclosure side. That is kind of where we're seeing the most momentum here. I, I don't see momentum in terms of stress tests. In fact, if you look at the FSOC report, I don't think you'll see mention of stress tests. Um, and it's a question, you know, a good question as to why. You, you will see mention of scenario scenario analysis and that I think that's a more of a voluntary uh, effort, uh, a non-binding kind of industry-wide kind of approach rather than firm specific approach that you would have in a stress testing regime. Um, that that is I mean, that's a tool that um, essentially the Fed is deciding has decided that it is not bringing forward. Um, you certainly don't see it um, played up with any kind of um, you know sort of uh, you know, uh, fanfare certainly in the in the FSOC report. Mm -hmm. um, your question about about um, you sort of other countries getting ahead of us. I mean, I, I think it's always important to see what other countries are doing. You know, here in the U.S., we're Americans. We kind of do things our way. You know, and you know, a lot of times people aren't going to say we're going we're not going to do it the you know European way. But it's it's important to see what they're what they are doing. What is working? 
and what isn't working and to bring those approaches into the conversations that um, are occurring within the regulatory bodies and to try to have those um, and try to learn from, from what, what is being um, tried sort of across the pond and in other countries. And um, I think that's an, a, that, that should be going on, you know, at this moment, we should be, we should be doing that. And at the same time, we've, we've got to really be coming up with our own, uh, sort of our own set of what we think the tools are going to be here that are going to help steer the financial sector through, you know, through these, you know, harms and opportunities. I mean, I, I, I am taking, I'm sensing that you had some disappointment in the FSOC report that came out last night didn't doesn't well, go I, far I, enough I, not I, specific i mean i you know if, if you look at, if you look at where we are vis-a-vis -vis where we were last year i mean this is kind of extraordinary you've got you know that you've got the financial stability oversight council starting to grapple with um, a very important risk and that actually has not been done before so i you know applaud the fsoc for that for that very good work um, i think there is more work to be done um, and I think that uh, those agencies that are part of the FSOC, I mean, it, it, they, they, have all, they have quite a number of very um, important tools that can really help in this maneuvering, this, this uh, navigation that we've been talking about. So I think there's quite a bit of opportunity. I think the um, executive order from the Biden administration was a really um, terrific uh, opportunity for the FSOC to step up and try to, um, you know, try to say something here uh, important. But there, there's quite a bit of, there's, you know, this, there's quite a bit more to do here. And, you know, it'll be good to see how they, you know, how they, how they take on the challenge, but they have, they've described it. Now we, now we need some action. We need, we need to actually start combating it. Okay. And I mean, okay, so let's shift to the private sector. Um, you know, a lot of people aren't waiting. There is a lot of uh, activity. Banks are experimenting with different models um, of sustainability. Have you seen anything innovative coming out of the financial services system uh, in this yeah, space? You, yeah, you certainly see um, the financial sector and the financial sector writ large, not just the regulated entities, but but other, all kinds of financial firms really wanting to take this risk seriously. Now, some of them absolutely have to. If you look at the insurance companies, for goodness sakes, the insurance companies have been the first line of defense uh, to, I mean, they've been the kind of the canaries in the, in the mine shaft. They've been telling us, you know, that about climate risk for quite a while, because of course, they're the ones that are um, seeing the costs associated with climate events and having to, having to ensure them. Um, so the financial sector, I think, is is definitely getting on board. Uh, certainly, in terms of understanding that uh, you know that they have a role to play, um, and so and they and they understand it as a risk. They understand it as something that actually can threaten their own, um, you know, their own uh, profitability and their own sense of. Um, uh, survival. So I, I think you're starting to see, um, you know, that they're taking it seriously. But, you know, at the end of the day, I think they're going to need some, you know, they need some kind of guidance, they're going to need some sort of framework by which to know how to, how to, you know, how to, how to operate, how to deploy their, um, sort of their, 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 their credit extension mm -hmm. activities into a sustainable frame. Yeah, rules of the road. Um, there's so there's so many pieces of this, but we're running we're running out of time. So uh, we're going into COP, obviously, in a, a couple of weeks, um, the big climate summit. What would a successful summit look like to you? Yeah. So the um, there's I, I think a lot that 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 still needs to happen because of course President Biden himself will be going to COP, which is just an extraordinary statement of how um, existential this threat is and how important it is to address it in a you know in an international setting and um, uh, I I'm hoping that when he goes he actually um, has something to say in terms of Congress's role in uh, stepping up to the climate challenge and figuring out what what needs to be done legislatively. It would be great if he had that um, kind of that that commitment in his pocket. We know <laughs> where that stands. <laughs> you know, um, uh, but I think that that's 
That's that, that would be very important. And I think um, it would be good too if he could talk about um, where the FSOC is gonna go next. I mean, essentially, I think he, there's a lot to applaud with, with what that report does, but what is the US, how, is, how are these agencies gonna come together? What are they gonna do? What are they, how are they gonna help, help us, um, you know, help, help us confront this, uh, this really important risk? Yeah, I don't know. I'm not as optimistic as you about Congress, right? Um, I don't, if he goes empty handed in terms of, you know, something from Congress, is it still workable? Yeah, well, I, again, it's it is supposed to be, you know, a whole of government approach, and mm -hmm. it would be good to see, um, sort of have an understanding of what the non legislative solutions might be. And that was really the promise and the opportunity of the FSOC report. What 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 can be done outside of needing, you know, actually needing money, needing legislation. And there is really quite a bit, quite a bit that could be done and it would be good to arm him with those kind of ideas. Okay, all right. All right, lots of, lots happening in this space. Sarah, thank you so much. This has been really My informative. Pleasure. My pleasure, thank you for having me. All right, folks, we are back and we have a really terrific panel now to dig deeper into the topic of sustainable finance. So let me start by introducing our guests today. Um, Suzanne Gabori is Director General of Private Sector Operations at the Asian Development Bank. Welcome, Suzanne. Deborah Lair, Vice Chairman and Executive Director of the Paulson Institute. And Donna McNamara, Director and Global Head of Trade Pro Product Commercialization and ESG strategy at City. Donna has some really interesting projects we're gonna dig into, but first let's let's sort of start with a big picture. Uh, Sarah talked a little bit about how you define sustainable finance, but I'd like to hear from you guys. You're sort of in the trenches and seeing what's happening. Um, what are you, what sort of examples are you seeing of sustainable finance that are working or good? What are some of the best examples? Suzanne, why don't we start with you? No, thank you very much, Lorraine. And I really enjoyed the, the discussion with Sarah as well, because I think there was a lot of great questions in there. Um, you know, it, it gets down to it's, some of the questions uh, that uh, Sarah had brought up is, is what is sustainable finance as well? Uh, because I think you have differing definitions of that. Uh, but, you know, from my perspective, I've worked in the private sector side of development finance for, you know, many, many years. But for, for, for me and for the Asian Development Bank, it really takes into account considerations for, you know, it's a broader, besides finance, it's the environment, it's social, it's government governance as well as you need to be financially sustainable. So therefore you have to have bankability. You know, the deals need to be self-sustaining. So when you're looking at that, um, what we're trying to do is we're trying to look at numerous examples where uh, things can actually, uh, you can use new tools, you can be innovative. Um, and we've been doing that uh, knowing the climate agenda is up there. We've heard about COP26. There's been a lot of momentum around that. So for us, you know, we've been also looking at how do we mobilize the private sector for that? Uh, we've been trying to do that through um, looking at new innovative structures. We've been looking at uh, bringing in blended finance structures, working with uh, partnerships, uh, bringing in effectively public PPPs, public-private partnerships, working with stakeholders. Uh, so for example, recently uh, we announced uh, that uh, with uh, between ADB, Goldman Sachs and Bloomberg Philanthropies, uh, we've announced a, a, an innovation fund at $25 million. It's a grant-based blended finance uh, facility where the whole focus is on climate mitigation and adaptation in South uh, and Southeast Asia. And the whole purpose is to uh, support sustainable, low carbon economic development. We've also used other funds where we have uh, have access to, to actually crowd in the private sector in deals, in solar deals, for example, in Uzbekistan. We have numerous, numerous examples, but those kind of give you a, a little bit of the idea of the kinds of things that we're involved in. And it's very broad. We need to be innovative and we need to uh, work together. It's all about partnerships, I think, at this point. Yeah, I mean, we're asking a lot Lot of the money, right? It's, you know, maybe back in the old days, it was, hey, how are we going to turn a profit with this money, right? How are we going to make money? Now it's, it's, we're asking the money to do so much more. Yeah. Um, Deborah, have you seen any innovations uh, in the private or public space with sustainable finance? 
Yeah, I think one one of the most exciting things that we've seen over the course of the last five years has been that this has changed from being a philanthropic activity to an actual for-profit activity. And so that sustainable finances come into the mainstream. And that follows on then with a lot of drive coming from the private sector. In countries like China, a lot of the growth is driven from the top, from the government. But in the US, it's really coming from the private sector where they've stepped up. And we're at a tipping point where we start to see that there are huge opportunities in environmental goods and services. And so the private equity money is coming in. We work with TPG, for example, and they have a fund that they've just launched to support environmental goods and services, the TPG, uh, TPG Rise Climate, which was oversubscribed because they see it's almost like the next tech boom. We're seeing the climate business boom. And I think it's gonna be transformational. And governments in some cases are almost behind where the private sector is going. And it's really enthusiastic, I mean, and, and exciting. And there's a lot of enthusiasm and the regulatory structure in many ways is following behind. That is at some point going to be an issue that governments need to address. We saw the beginning of that with the step that Secretary Yellen has taken but we're gonna need a lot more to ensure that as money starts to go into these projects for investors, they feel that they're getting what they're investing in. And we don't see a large amount of greenwashing, not just here in the US where obviously we have a better um, regulatory structure and more transparency, but as a lot of the money needs to go into emerging markets that need so much of the change and quite honestly, so much of the finance to meet their climate goals, just to make sure that there's transparency about where that money is going. Yeah. And I think, you know, I think you're right. I think business has gotten ahead, um, is, is leading the way uh, in a lot of places. Donna, you're, you guys are one example of this. Talk to me, uh, City has a very innovative program where uh, you, well, I'll let you explain it. Talk to us about your partnership with McCormick, one of your clients. Okay, great, thank you. Um, it's been a great conversation so far. So thank you for having me. Um, yeah, City, uh, we just, uh, it was in the uh, press a couple of months ago now. We did a um, sustainable supply chain finance solution with um, partnering with IFC, the World Bank, and uh, McCormick, one of our, um, one of our uh, clients, uh, coming out of the commercial bank of city. Um, and you know this was this was really the result of probably about 18 months worth of work um, in developing um, a structure for that we felt would work for the sustainable supply chain, talking about greenwashing is mentioned and reputational risk as well. Um, but we wanted to make sure that we had, some standards consistency in place that that we could replicate that we could literally commercialize so um so we partnered with ifc a longtime partner of citibank um on leverage they leveraging our established supplier finance program um and put uh, mccormick um who who wanted to um uh, incentivize their their pepper suppliers to maintain or improve standards of sustainability aligned with mccormick's own strategy and i'll get back to that in a minute and so we put the program together it's it's based on a combination of ifc performance standards um the city of course with credit profile and uh, mccormick's um sustainability targets so it's it's launched now it's it's ramping up and we're very excited about it um, because we think it's something that we can replicate um, and we can deliver and continue delivering to our clients. But so in, in a nutshell though, City is, is um, financing McCormick's suppliers and those suppliers in, in layman's terms, basically get a better deal from City if they do the right thing in terms of sustainability. Is that, sum, does that sum it up? More or less, yeah. It's, it's, okay. it's, a, it's an incentivized progress model based structure where you know, the suppliers will get an incentive, incentivized discounting um, if they, you know, meet the standards or improve, depending on the uh, clients, in this case, McCormick's strategy, right? So it, it's, that's absolutely right. In a nutshell, I would, I would agree with that. Okay. And so, Don, I want you in to answer this, but also, Suzanne, I want to go back to you on this, too. As we start doing these innovative um, things in, fi in, in finance, how do we know when they, when they work? How do you how do you define success? So Donna, do you know yet if this is working? 
So we know that it's working as a, um, I would say as a structure, we have not only the McCormick deal, we have other, other deals that we've done that are in process and development and are just ramping up. We won't know the impact um, because on supplier finance, as you're familiar, it takes, you know, we have to ramp up a program and suppliers have to, it's, it's basically a year over year, um, a review of their, of their progress, right? So we won't know if of, of the real impact until probably, you know, early next year until we see the maturity of the program. However, it is, it is taking, it, it does have a lot of traction in the market. We're seeing a lot of interest uh, in particular in the consumer and industrial space um, and also um, in the telecom and media space and across the E, the S and the G, right? So we, there, are, there, there are many companies coming out to earlier comments made about the private sector versus the public sector. This is really becoming uh, not, not philanthropic based. It's more, okay, this is gonna hit our bottom line. And you know, there's, there's a shift in, in looking at scope three emissions and we have a robust sustainability strategy from a corporate perspective. How are we going to influence our supply chain to make sure that we're mitigating that risk and that we're, we're really maintaining the standards uh, from our, that are based on our own strategy and goals? Yeah, well, we're going to circle back to you because in a few years, I want to know how it's going. But Suzanne, uh, ADB, you know, you, you've said you've had some successful programs. What does that what does that mean? What successful mean? Yeah, it, it's it's a really good question because it's it's something that if you want to to be, you know, sustainable financing to be effective, it needs to be, you know, something that Donna has already mentioned. It needs to be embedded as part of the the core of the operations that you're doing. It needs to be there. Uh, with the rules of the game, you know, Sarah referred to uh, frameworks and that kind of thing, you know, kind of guidelines, you need to have um, those agreed at the very beginning. Uh, so on an ex ante kind of a framework basis. But with ADB, what we have is we have what we call a development impact framework or development effectiveness. So you have those agreed parameters from the very beginning. And then you work with your clients uh, as you go through this restructuring or the structuring of the investment. And then that also includes through the lifetime of the investment. So it's not just, you know, after you've signed on the bottom line, it's throughout the whole life cycle of that uh, particular investment. So you want to make sure that everyone is living up to their obligations. You want to be out there. You want to look and see, okay, maybe something is, is going, uh, there's an issue there. How do you resolve it? So it's, it's a dynamic involved, uh, activity. But one of the things I think that was really interesting that was raised is about risk. And I think that one of the aspects of this is, you know, uh, Donna was talking about talk, working with the IFCs, the multilaterals, uh, the development banks have an, uh, an opportunity to crowd in the private sector because we have an ability to take risk we need to we need to, we have the ability to develop risk structures to, to bring the private sector into these types of things on agreed terms and basis well so what i mean and and what is in it for the private sector really i mean it's there's a lot of virtue signaling okay that's fine it's good pr for the companies um but you know, donna wouldn't you make more money if you just did you know through a traditional you know plain vanilla lending um yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, I you think, know, <laughs> I, no, I think, I think, no, I think two things. I, I, I agree with you. Yes. I agree with you that that is the question um, when, and you know, we're asked to, we asked ourselves that as well when we ventured down this path a couple of years ago, because it did, this is not the first time we're looking at sustainable supply chain as, as my colleagues on, on, on the, um, on the panel would agree, you know, this has been around for a while. It's not taken hold until, you know, probably 18 months ago, right? So this is where the standards and the frameworks come in and the consistency and all those, all those things that we knew about 10 years ago are now, now taking structure and taking hold, which is great. It's all positive. From a banking perspective and from a financing perspective, yeah, we're, you know, it's all, it's not all about the PL, but it, yes, there's a PL component of it. Yes, you know, everyone's in and you you, you want to make money, but that is not our first goal in this. This is this is we want to deliver to our clients and in doing so we want to leverage city's leadership in this space which is 
a very long history and dating back to the equator principles, uh, when being one of the founding banks and delivering that to our clients because that's what our clients are looking at, right? What I just said about, you know, we're seeing an increased focus on clients looking at their own sustainable targets and really linking that to the treasury function, procurements, and saying, okay, how do we improve this? How do we ensure that we're covering not only our scope one and two, we're hitting our scope three, and not only from an emissions perspective, but overall our activities. So we may be doing the right thing on the social front, but what are our suppliers doing? And how do we get to that point where we have that transparency and visibility into the supply chain? Um, and then we, we incentivize them where we can or where we need, where we think we, we should. So when we look at it, you know, when we look at this, yes, we're not, it's not about the money initially, but as in any other product developments uh, and in any other commercialization effort, you go out there and you're, you're okay to kind of not make that money up front, but we know that, you know, we, we believe in it and we say, okay, you know, this is something that can grow and have impact. And eventually, you know, it will, it will balance itself out because that's how we look at it. It's just like it, any other product development, you know, it's, uh, and, yeah, we're watching capitalism, you know, evolve, I think. Um, so, so Deborah, I, I want to throw this one to you. Let's shift gears a little bit. Uh, we have all of these sort of um, maybe customized or bespoke deals out there, a lot of things. Let's just focus on the, the E part of ESG, environmental and climate in particular. Um, wouldn't it just be easier to tax carbon or put a price on carbon? And, and wouldn't that just be an easier way to shift all the money into the right places? Uh, you know, why aren't we doing that? Or is, who is doing that? I think China just started doing this, right? Europe does it. Do we, do we need just a carbon tax? Would that be a, an easier way to get there? I think first we have to start between the difference between a carbon tax or just putting a price on carbon. And I think the important mm -hmm. issue first is we need to look at how we put a price on carbon and how we don't treat it just as a free good with the assumption that there's no price for polluting. And once we start to look at it that way, then it becomes a method of how best to do that. For China, they've decided to launch a national carbon exchange, which is pretty phenomenal. They've started with one industry, energy. It's the largest in the world. Uh, already. It accounts for about 45% of China's emissions just by bringing energy onto their exchange. But the really important fact is it accounts for almost 15% of global emissions. That's more than all of the United States. And when you think that China has now put a price on 15% of global emissions and they're going to expand it um, to about six to seven other industries, they could essentially bring 40% of all global emissions under a pricing scheme. When you go back to your question about, can you think innovatively about what to do? There's a lot of financial instruments that you can start to think about when you look at carbon with offsets and credits now becoming sort of the currency of climate. So it's a very exciting, but somewhat a distressing issue when the United States is not following suit. There's a lot of support in the US for having a carbon tax, for example, which um, our chairman, Hank Paulson, thinks is probably the easiest way to address it. One of the political concerns, of course, and social concerns is that maybe it's unequal in the imposition because would it be harder on people who have, who can't afford it, so it's a regressive tax. There are certainly ways to address that, but the politics of raising taxes is really, I think, what holds us back in the US. The Europeans are moving ahead, other countries are moving, I wouldn't be surprised if we start to see a lot of this, again, coming from the private sector as we look at um, how to put a price on carbon and that it, it stems from private carbon exchanges being started and hopefully then the regulatory structure would follow. Yeah, interesting. So um, what about, we, we do have a lot of these structures. So ch you mentioned China obviously is the big new one on the block. Uh, are, how are the numbers working? It, it, you know, it, how is carbon being priced in China? Is it is the figure high enough? What's So they're just really, I mean, it's very nascent. And although they have trading in the sector, it's really pretty basic. It's spot trading and it's sort of an assigned price. They're nowhere near the levels. I think it's, it's around, it's under $10 uh, per ton, which is significantly lower than what we see in Europe. Mm -hmm. There's a way to go. 
but already they were publishing some initial statistics and already they're starting to see a slowdown in the demand. I think the challenge for China, and quite honestly, we're seeing a little bit of that challenge here with the energy shortages, with the price of oil and others going up, it's causing in China, you've read about significant um, blackouts and energy shortages. Their banks have been told to go ahead and start financing coal again. Here in the US, coal usage is up 22%. The economics of these issues is really gonna be one of the biggest obstacles that we have to overcome when it comes to climate. I do think there are lots of ways to make money going back to your point. It's not all about the lending. Certainly in the private equity sector, we see a lot of opportunity for PE kinds of returns. And of course, China is always the land of big numbers, but uh, Goldman Sachs did a study that estimated that the opportunity for companies in the environmental goods and services space in China is a four, uh, $16 trillion opportunity. And a Chinese who studied it corrected me on that point and said they had just done a study and said it's a $74 trillion opportunity with the potential of creating 40 to 100 million jobs. So if we look at that in our own economy, it can be an engine of growth, not only here, but it can be an engine of growth globally. And in the US, there is some experimentation, right? At the state level, at least. Um, we have a new, a new carbon trading system in Washington state. Yeah, uh, that's and coming California online. has mm -hmm. been a leader in that as well. So do we have a, pat I mean, do we, is there a problem if there's a patchwork of these systems? I mean, certainly I would think from an investing perspective, it would be better if there was one standard. And as we look, and certainly if the standard, and if you know, the US is typically a leader when it comes to standards, if we were to take the lead on setting what that is, especially if it was then coming to issues around carbon credits and carbon offsets, um, because a lot of companies will use that in their transition to try to reach carbon neutrality. If we're working with other countries like China who may not be as transparent or may not enforce in the same way that we would, the standards are significantly different. And going back again, it puts some of our companies or our investors at risk. The challenge with China is they're pretty aggressive. They are building out, they're building a futures exchange for carbon. And they're also talking to countries along their famous Belt and Road Initiative to see if they can work with countries in Southeast Asia, countries in the Middle East to help them build their own carbon exchanges. And because the trading would be fairly thin, allow them then to come trade on China's national exchange. So in addition to sort of that 30% globally that they bring under, they could be bringing other countries um, own carbon trading under and on their own exchange, wow. which creates a whole different dynamic when it comes to both the pricing and um, the other related issues, the innovative um, mechanism, financial tools that we can start to build around carbon. Wow, okay. Um, I'd like to invite the audience, if you have any questions, um, please go ahead and, and drop them into the, the system and I'll be getting them here uh, while we wait for those to queue up. Um, Suzanne, just while we're on the subject of Asia, um, you know, Asia, the Asia, uh, Asian and Pacific companies, like are they, and, and the governments in uh, Asia and the Pacific, what are what sort of their approach to sustainability? Is it different than what we're seeing in the West? Um, I, I think from a from a corporate point of view, uh, you know, there is very similar is to the West. Um, you know, people are, are driven by very similar parameters. Of course, wherever you're investing the jurisdiction, there may be differences there. But I do think that, uh, you know, some of the topics or the issues we've already heard, it's about that risk return uh, parameter. And I think that um, what is, is becoming normalized within the market is that they're not uh, discrete. They can be um, uh, to, you know, take, take into consideration at the same time. And there's a growing body of evidence to demonstrate that with better husbandry of your investments, which includes, you know, all aspects of, of ESG, environment, which includes climate, you end up with a, a better return in the end because there is the unintended consequences and, and those factors that I think Sarah had mentioned at the very beginning uh, of the factors that are already taking place that are, you know, you see the real world events. So I think that, you know, with that, uh, people are being pragmatic. They're looking for solutions. 
Um, and uh, they're trying different ways. I think that, you know, there is a, a, a quite a, given that Asia and the Pacific is quite, uh, quite it encompasses quite a number of countries, that they, they're looking for solutions as to any one thing. So I do think that you'll end up uh, with regards to uh, renewable, for example, focused on renewable energy or replacement of that, you'll need to have uh, discussions in country, what kind of uh, structural changes will be needed. And then through that, you'll, you'll come up with various uh, multi energy platforms. And I think there's a lot of innovation, a lot of money, which is actually being pushed into that right now. Um, we see it in across the board on in venture capital and fintech and in various solutions um, in that. I had a really great conversation this morning with an American um, fintech uh, provider who was looking at solar panel solutions. So I think that, you know, there is that recognition across the board. They're looking to bring that into Asia. So I think that there's a lot of cross fertilization on this uh, that's going on. And it's really exciting and a dynamic market, which is going on right now. Interesting. So uh, we do have some questions from the audience. Um, and China is at the top of the list here. Uh, one of the questions gets to the issue of trust. And, and I'm going to I'm going to expand a little bit on the questioners um, on the question. First of all, we have to trust uh, what these countries are doing. Do we do we really uh, is there's a lack of transparency uh, in places like China? Uh, you know, do we can we trust them to actually be committed to this? Can we believe them when they say they're doing certain things? Uh, you know, how do we how do we get past that problem? Did you want me to? Deborah, you, why don't you why don't you start? <laughs> Suzanne, do you want to start or would you like me or to I'll, start? I'll over to you. Go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> okay. I think, you know, of course, that's an excellent point. And that's always, uh, always an issue um, when we're talking about working in kind of semi-market economies that are not known for being in tran transparent. The good thing about a lot of what China is doing is it's um, traceable. I mean, we can track what's going on on the exchange. We can see what's happening with the pilot projects that they have on their exchanges. We can see how they're using FinTech. Um, we can read the regulations and we can see if they're enforcing them. We can track now, and there are many NGOs who are on the ground, but also through things like satellite technology, where the polluting factories are, when they're turned on, when they're turned off. Um, so it's much harder to hide a lot of those things. I think one of China's own biggest challenge is getting reliable numbers. The reason that the national exchange only started with one industry is because they couldn't get reliable numbers from the state-owned enterprises on the other ones. And until they work with them on how to collect the numbers, make sure that they have educated staff who understand climate, and understand the issues that we've been talking about today. There's a huge need for capacity building in China. It's gonna definitely be a long-term issue. For anybody who's investing in climate issues in China, if you're looking at it from that perspective, absolutely you have to do your homework. Um, and regulatory risk in China right now, I would say is probably the biggest risk, more than some of the financial related issues, just because if you're looking at the direction that the government is moving, there are certain sectors that they're taking on, tech being one of them, tech being the core in many cases of what we're talking about with climate because it's the key to the solutions. Wow, Su Suzanne, you wanna to add to that? Yeah, I just wanted to say that, you know, obviously ADB invests in China and I'm coming from the private sector point of view. So we have very clear principles of how we work. And so, you know, looking at uh, principles of transparency and, and uh, traceability as much as you can, uh, those are all the things. I will tell you that there is a lot of goodwill out there. And, and starting from a position of trust, I think you can build those bridges. I think it's really important to build those bridges, to bring everyone along, along with you so that they can help develop those skills and abilities, things that Deborah was mentioning about, you know, sometimes these state-owned enterprises don't have the skills or the manpower. But I do think that, you know, China faces a slightly different issue than, than we would in, in Europe and North America is that their, their economy is structured very differently. So you're going to have different drivers. They have much more, uh, for example, impact of, of uh, uh, employment, for example, that is a direct consequence of structural changes within the um, any of the, the economy in the, the, the renewal space or, or on the on the climate front. So 
But I do think that there is a lot of goodwill. We have seen it firsthand. There is a lot of goodwill. Uh, and I think that, you know, if nothing else, you can start on a demonstration effect, project by project to show that. And then, you know, people are, are smart. And so, you know, if you find to, uh, good returns with new technologies that improve the climate, it will be replicated, so. And, and Jonna, this is a, a corollary, I guess, to this question. I, I, you know, in the US, we're talking a lot about uh, possible regulation on just disclosure by public companies uh, in this space. So, you know, when, when city has these projects, when other banks uh, have these projects or companies promise to reduce their emissions, um, you know, do we need more regulation? on disclosure? Oops, I think we lost you. Yeah, sorry. There you go. Yes, I, I think that's the direction we're going in when there's the increased focus from our major corporations in the US and looking at their own standards and they themselves are looking for you know, uh, limited assurance from their auditors on, on what they're reporting and how they're reporting. There's been an increased focus across the, the broader supply chain on validation of data through the governing bodies. So I think there's the, it's developing more uh, as the focus on sustainability and in particular environmental um, is becoming the forefront in the, in the discussion. On, on sustainable finance solutions, but more importantly, on a company's strategy and reporting around sustainability. Okay. Um, all right. So let's uh, let's take a, a, a step back, and and we, we have to wrap it up in a few minutes. But let's is there, one of the questions we got from the audience uh, was about challenges being faced, and it was directed uh, primarily at you, uh, Suzanne, and ADP. You know, what are the what are the challenges faced by the ADP and how can banks like ADP work with public and private sector? Um, I'd like you to answer that, but, but you know, Deborah and Donna, I think the broader question also applies, right? How do we, how do we overcome, what are the big challenges with private and public sector partnerships? How do we overcome that? I think in the first instance that right now we're in a post or in the middle of a pandemic. So mm -hmm. we're in a, you know, developing short, medium, long-term solutions to that. So it does require a partnership. Uh, so within, you know, ADB, we're looking at how do you um, create those, those partnerships across the board. And it's not only in climate, because we know that that is uh, affected on technology, on health, education, and also in food security. So to me, climate is, is comes across the board. Uh, there's lots of challenges, my goodness me. And, and uh, I, I think that one of the things is that we, you know, has been mentioned before is that there's a lot of liquidity out there. But where is it going to go? And I do think that uh, this is one of the tricks is, is to trying to find out or trying to devise appropriate risk structures uh, that the private sector will then come in and invest into these investments. The other aspect of it is, is a bankability of uh, sufficient uh, um, number of bankable transactions that again lots of liquidity out there so we're looking at uh, opportunities we're looking at options of how do we facilitate how do we encourage those uh, those uh, you know the creation of those uh, uh, transactions and that also then looks into the upstream side of things is how do you create the right environments in these countries and I think the PPP structures are very good for that uh, particularly we've seen examples in the power sector where you can work together with the governments, put appropriate um, uh, legislation in place, put appropriate contracts in place where you can actually have transparency and then people know what they're dealing with. So uh, no end of challenges, but uh, I do think that there are solutions out there. And again, it's about partnerships. So it, you know, I, I think that, that we need to bring the private sector along with us. We need to bring the know-how and the knowledge along with us. Uh, and I do think that there are many, many opportunities there and we look forward to working together with everyone on this. Yeah, and, and so Donna, you, you know, as you're expanding your uh, structured or sustainable finance mechanisms, right? You, you, you've got them going now with at least one client. And as you start to try to work with other clients, like what, what challenges are you running into? 
So I think it's along the same lines, you know, because in a lot of ways we're not, uh, we're developed, but we're not developed. So there's, because of the inconsistency still that we're seeing, the lack of standards, we look to anchors like the development agencies to provide that structure. And in some cases, in particular in trade, where we have other initiatives going on, where we're looking for standards around definitions of sustainability based on, based on what's established in the framework, but applying it with a trade lens, right? And then you have the, the always the reputational risk element and the validation of data, right? So that is a challenge in of itself, because if we look at what, what we're trying to do from a financing perspective, incentivize the suppliers, in some ways, it could be viewed as we're putting more, uh, the, the, the corporation could be putting more um, uh, burden on the, on the supplies, and that's not their intention, right? So that normalization, that kind of looking at, okay, what's the expectation uh, of the company and how do we help the supplier, right? So that's a challenge sometimes, not because of the lack of desire to help the supplier, but because of the lack of standards sometimes and the, and the lack of transparency, I would say. But I think we're getting there. I think we're getting there more with as you know, as the development banks come in, um, as you know, the ICC is has this, um, you know, sustainable trade standards. Um, we will we'll quickly get there. I think we'll quickly get there because yeah. it is a topic. It's complicated. Boy, the more the more you guys talk, the more questions I have. So um, <laughs> we, we do have to wrap it up though. And and uh, Deborah, I'm gonna let you bring us home here. The the there are a lot of challenges. I mean Don, I, you kind of surprised me a little bit. What you know, what you're doing sounds so complicated. Uh, you know, can it's how long is it going to take us to kind of get a system in place? This seems like a an immediate need, but the solution is still kind of a ways away. So let me conclude just on two points. One, there's a very simple but major challenge, and that is we don't have an um, a clear definition of what is green. And so green is defined differently, even across different countries, let alone across different um, uh, within an own country, but around the world. And so one of the first things we need is a common definition. The Chinese and the Europeans are working on that. We're not really part of that discussion. But the other challenge I would say is in addition to how we look at climate change, the one thing we don't take into account is biodiversity. And we're facing a huge challenge on that with a loss almost a thousand percent faster of species. And so one of the challenges, how do you turn trees and bees and butterflies who are essential to our water systems, to our food supply, to the air that we breathe into asset classes? And so I know that time is short, but I think that is another big area as we're thinking through what we're doing on climate to make sure that it's not done at the expense of biodiversity. Right. I think biodiversity and human capital are going to be the next huge conversations, at least here in the U.S. it's happening. So Meridian, uh, that's your cue for another panel. Uh, thank you, ladies, so much. This has been very informative, and I really appreciate your time. Great. Thanks to Meridian. Thank you. Thank you.